All right, just a couple of um, procedural notes. Um, you'll uh, notice that the microphone here in the center for the question and answer period uh, is fixed, so please plan to line up and ask questions there after the about a half an hour of uh, remarks by the speakers. The mic will not uh, necessarily project very loudly, but be assured that it is being captured. This will be uh, broadcast on BYU FM tomorrow at noon uh, on XM Radio at BYU's uh, station 143 on the XM dial on um, Sirius Radio. Um, once upon a time, there was a world, there was a country that had ambitions to lead the world in environmental consciousness, if you like, um, and that country is the United States of America. Uh, the EU at that point um, lagged far behind the United States in many environmental issues, partly because the European Union as a political entity didn't exist, but the European community had no real treaty basis for dealing with the environment. It stuck it in here and there, but there was no very large concerted attempt to deal with environmental problems. Um, now the tables are turned, of course, and why this is so is um, a quite a complicated uh, matter. For sure, the oil shocks of the 1970s played a big role. Europe, very, very energy dependent. I remember uh, my first trip to Europe seeing $4 a gallon gas and thinking there must be some kind of typo at the gas station, that surely no one could be expected to pay $4 for a gallon of gas, but of course, they were, and they did, and they do, and now even more. Um, but there are more reasons for that uh, change than, than just the price of gas. This increase in energy prices has been a huge spur to innovation in Europe, and that's kind of the, where we wanted to start tonight. Um, to, a, to a certain extent for Americans, this is frustrating because Europeans now lead in, in, in so many environmental venues, and we sometimes get this sense that Europe has set itself up as a kind of moral superpower, telling the Americans what to do and the rest of the world what to do on the environment. Um, uh, but on the other hand, in this country, what's interesting is the way in which everybody's an environmentalist now or claims to be an environmentalist. We have to invent new concepts for people who, who, uh, who oppose environmentalism. I'm from a timber family, so the concept in my family is the tree hugger. Uh, but if you're from Utah, you could probably invent alternatives, uh, the, the, the road closer or the, the canyon crony or the boulder buddy or something like that. But no, nobody wants to be sort of exactly against the environment. But all of those kinds of formulations have at their heart a sense of tension between business on the one hand and the environment on the other hand. So what we wanted to ask our two panelists to do tonight was really talk about that tension. And is that a real tension? Um, how can that be resolved? Uh, could being greener be good for business? And so I think we've chosen two outstanding uh, speakers tonight. Um, let me just introduce them very briefly. Ann Burrell is the Deputy Head of Unit for International Relations and Enlargement in the European Commission, that is to say part of the EU, uh, Environment Directorate General. Uh, she is currently a visiting fellow at the University of Washington in Seattle, the Jackson School, and the European Union Center at UW, and is doing research, in fact, uh, academic research on what businesses in the Northwest are doing on sustainability and asking the question whether Europeans can learn from America. Nathan Furr is an assistant professor of entrepreneurship and strategy at BYU. Uh, he has acted as a founder or advisor to a number of startups, Web 2.0, Clean Technology, sat on uh, the board of the Utah Solar Energy Association, also been a senior consultant at Green Tech Media, the leading research center on clean technology, and was a co-founder of the Stanford Clean Technology Research Project. Nathan Furr is also the author, co-author of Nail It, Then Scale It. And we've asked them, as is our custom now, to take uh, just about a half an hour uh, to, um, uh, to, to introduce the subject, and then we'll move over into question and answer period. I'll signal when that's due. And in the meantime, uh, Laura Cook, the Administrative Director of the Center, will be passing around some sign-up sheets just so we can get a sense of who's here in the audience. And I encourage you, if you would, please, to leave your name and email address for us there. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn the time over to Ann and Nathan. I think we were going to start just by introducing ourselves and our perspective, and then Anne was going to kick us off with the work that she's been doing, and then I would offer a perspective. So, I, 
I guess since I'm talking, I can introduce myself. So um, <clears throat> in some ways, I'm an odd fellow, but in some ways, I'm an appropriate fellow for this talk, um, simply because I come out of a very business orientation. I worked in strategy consulting, um, helping big corporations for a time, um, very much a believer in the power of innovation and business to change the landscape. Um, did my uh, PhD work at, at Stanford and come from kind of an, uh, an intellectual background of both economics and organization theory, uh, which is kind of an interesting collision, and ended up focusing on entrepreneurship. And uh, I did a lot of my dissertation work and continue to do research on how innovation occurs. What are the barriers to innovation? What are the facilitators of that? And uh, with a real focus on clean technology and specifically solar photovoltaics. Um, which has been deeply tied into the actions of the European Union and the United States. And so I come at this uh, very much from a perspective of, of business and innovation, which you say, okay, you know, we uh, framed the, the, the tension there. What does it have to do with policy? Are, are they in conflict? And, and I hope to address those. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I come to this from a somewhat different background, but perhaps coming to a convergent opinion about yeah. the world. Uh, um, I started out much more on the scientific side, looking at natural processes, understanding, for instance, soil erosion, the subject I, I studied as a graduate student. Um, but as I have developed in my career, I've come to feel that really understanding the physical problems is very important, and I don't, don't want to belittle it in any way, but that in a way is the easy part. But the hard part is dealing with people, dealing with policies, dealing with the interaction between the natural world and our human world, which is largely an economic world, a cultural world. Um, in the commission, I'm working particularly I'm working particularly on um, international affairs, but while I am here in the United States, I'm looking at issues related to, indeed, the role of business. And I see that kind of as a continuity of my intellectual development from the physical science through the policy and looking at the role of business. Um, but I, I wanted to start this evening by just giving a little bit of picture of where we are in Europe on environment policy. And certainly, indeed, back in the 70s, we were inspired by the US. Uh, EU environment policy grew out of uh, the, the global movement of interest on environment. Particularly, we saw the Clean Air Act that had been just adopted in the US, the, the Clean Water Act. And we decided it was time to move ahead in Europe. And perhaps one of the interesting but little known facts was at that time, actually, one of the main drivers behind the development of EU environment policy was industry. It was German industry who, in Germany, they already had some pretty strict regulations on emissions, particularly air emissions. And they said, hey, you know, um, we've got a common market. We've got exchange of goods and services throughout uh, Europe. But it's not fair when our competitors down in Spain or someplace, well, I guess it wasn't Spain at that time, but in France, um, don't have to meet the same standards that we have to meet. So German industry was actually one of the driving forces behind the development of EU environment policy because they wanted the same standards, the same policy throughout Europe. And in fact, the policy was developed on the basis of a legal base for the single market because at that time there was no legal base for environment. So that, that was where things started and the policy evolved very much focused on individual emissions. And we, we did that pretty well. The problems of air emissions, the problem of clean drinking water, those, those, are, those are under control in Europe. Um, but then we get into more complicated problems. And we get into problems that are related to how environment relates to economic activity, how it relates to agriculture, how it relates to transport, how it relates to energy. And these are much more difficult, complex problems. And we changed our approach. We're looking much more strategically at the driving pressures behind environmental degradation and unwise use of resources. Um, we haven't yet got it completely solved, but we've got a pretty good 
legal basis. We've got over 300 pieces of major legislation, and it's, it's well accepted in Europe. Europeans are first much more tolerant of regulation than people are in the US, and that's for lots of historical and cultural reasons. Um, they also are quite concerned about environmental problems overall. Like, say, for instance, climate change is considered a serious problem in Europe. There's disagreement about how to handle it, how to address it, but there's very little disagreement about whether or not it's something that we ought to be concerned about. So there's a lot of public support. There's a lot of good legislation. Um, and we've gone quite a long ways. But I feel in a way we've, we've reached almost a kind of platform where this pure regulatory approach is good. We can certainly do some more integration into other policy areas, but we need to go further than that. And we need some more imaginative thinking. We need more innovation, including partnership with business. The EU as a whole is trying to promote innovation. We, we see that it's something that perhaps we don't do as well as some other parts of the world, including the US. The US is more innovative. The business culture is more open to taking risks. So what I'm, I'm trying to look at and trying to understand is what, what can we do? How can we move further in the non-regulatory approach to managing the environment? How, how can we move on? What can, what can we learn from what you're doing right here? <coughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I, I will add to my, uh, to my introduction that I do spend time in France as a visiting professor at one of their Grande Coles. So I do have a perspective in Europe from actually living there. Um, so hopefully I can uh, help contrast that. It's interesting, I think one of the things um, you, you mentioned, the European Union has been excellent in developing policy. And I think we could have a whole conversation about the history of policy in the United States. Maybe we can touch on that during the questions and, and answer session. But I wanted to highlight a couple fallacies that I feel like I run into in the US that maybe I don't run into so much um, in Europe. Um, fallacy number one is that the environment is a non-problem. Now, it depends where you are. I will admit that in Silicon Valley, I, there's generally agreement, like in the European Union, that global warming is clearly a problem, that we need to do something about it, and there's some motivation. But in other regions of the United States, I find either disbelief that, that global warming is, uh, is, uh, is a scientific fact, that's my own personal belief, but, or, or lack of motivation. Because in many ways, um, Global warming is a long-term problem. And business, while ideally should be about the short and the long-term, is often driven by short-term profits and gains. So I've had to think about, well, how is it that, what is the short-term motivation, if any, for the environment being uh, a problem? And actually, my answer, I didn't come up with my own answer. My answer came from a group of early innovators and venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Now these are people whose job it is to spot opportunities and then invest in those opportunities and they do extremely well. You know, they, these, they usually end up being billionaires. And they came up with a hypothesis that I support and that is there's a very simple trend dri that should be driving our short-term interest in the environment and the economy and that is simply look at population. If you look at the population of the world historically, in 1850, there's this turn. You start to see this rise from the 1800s, and then 1850, we see this sudden burst, uh, like a hockey stick, uh, or in mathematical terms, an exponential growth function. And we go from you know, a billion people to seven billion people in you know, 100, 150 years. And you think, OK, that's great. Uh, we've got a lot more people. Why does that matter? And the reason it matters is because if you look at the portion of those people in developed economies versus developing, the vast majority are in developing economies. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, look at the consumption of energy in the United States. We consume 20% of the world's energy. We used to be the largest consumers. China has surpassed us and yet represent only a fraction of that population. So what happens? There's like two scenarios. Scenario one is, you know, the, the vast majority of the world remains in dire poverty and doesn't consume energy. 
I, I don't know if that's a good outcome. I mean, I don't think I even have to answer that. The other scenario, which we're currently observing, I challenge you to visit almost any country, go to China, go to Chile, is that the developing economy, economies are developing that they're developing sources of wealth, that they're you know, developing sources of manufacturing, they're growing. And as the wealth of those economies rises, they demand more of everything. They want more energy, they want more goods, they want couches and cars and roads and all those kinds of things. So where does that all come from? If we already have, if right now we just have a small portion of the world consuming most of that, those goods and energy, it has to come from somewhere and if we're already worried about it, things like global warming or you know, simply drive up around the corner of the mountain and look at the pollution, I mean, what happens then? And so my argument and the argument of these other innovators is that's the big economic opportunity of your lifetime, is how do you solve the energy, how do you solve the healthcare, and how do you solve the production and delivery of goods for that, vastly, you know, that vast population that's developing? And so that's why I encourage my students to think about is that, you know, that's going to drive innovation in your lifetime. Um, the other fallacy I think we have is that uh, in the United States we have a fallacy, uh, policy aversion, I like to call it. This, I hear constantly this argument about why should we subsidize clean technology? If it can't stand on its own, then it's not good enough. And I almost want to like laugh. I, I say, well, why don't you look at the history of any modern industry? And I challenge you to find instances where government did not subsidize. In other words, if you look at any industry, you will find government subsidy supporting the genesis of that industry. So let me give you, you know, the internet. Where do we get the early seeds of the internet? From the Department of Defense spending on the ARPANET. Where do we get semiconductors, the very foundation of much of our modern productivity? It goes back to World War II and the investments the United States made in trying to defeat you know, the Germans because the Germans essentially had radar and were shooting down every plane that flew within their perimeters. And we had no, we didn't, and we're like, what is this stuff? And why do we lose like almost 90% of our, of our planes? And so they formed the Harvard Radio Lab led by Frederick Terman. He got the best scientists in the world and they started to, to, to figure out how do we do you know, electronic warfare. And that, the seeds of that were then transported to Silicon Valley when Fred, Frederick Terman went to Stanford. He brought the best and the brightest with him and really became the fertile soil of the semiconductor industry. And, you know, look at the oil industry today. I mean, I just saw an article that the oil industry, you know, they're a mature industry. Shouldn't they be able to stand on their own? Well, they get $21 billion in subsidies. So I just think this policy subsidy aversion is, is problematic. And then the last fallacy is that innovation happens in a vacuum. That somehow, without paying attention to how we're supporting innovation, that great things will come about and, we'll f and the solutions will be uh, to our problems will spring out of the minds of individual geniuses. And, and I'll just give you an example of, of some of the challenges. You have to think about innovation occurring in an ecosystem. So I have hopes for solar photovoltaics as a partial solution to energy problems. There's been multiple generations of innovation in solar. So kind of the de facto standard today is silicon photovoltaic, which is, you know, uh, same stuff you make semiconductors out of. But there's a whole generation of thin film producers, is what we call it, which held the promise of being able to produce solar panels in a more efficient way. So if you want to make a silicon solar panel, what do you do? You get silicon, you have to purify it to a very high degree, you have to grow it into an ingot, think of like a bread loaf, you have to slice it, you have to polish it, you have to put it into a module. And some of the second generation producers promise things like, you know, we could use, you know, a, a, a 1% of the semiconductor material that goes into a silicon wafer we could spray it down in a high throughput manufacturing environment and lower costs that way. And they were encouraged to enter the solar market because the European Union had established subsidies and created a market. And what's the hope there? The hope is that today this may not stand on its own, but if we encourage the market, we'll develop innovations that drop price 
so that we are competitive and we don't need subsidies anymore and we solve a problem. Now, the solar market has been, I mean, one solar CEO said it, it's changed so much it makes you want to cry. And the reason is because there were all these subsidies and then those subsidies, have, many of them have gotten pulled and retracted, which has collapsed the market kind of artificially. And so now these second generation technologies, which could displace silicon, are struggling for their very lives to see if they, if they can hold up against big factories built in China, producing kind of an old technology, maybe a little less efficient. I like to think of it kind of like, it's like a book, you know, a great novel. And you went to the novelist and said, I know you're only three fourths of the way through, but you got to finish it today, it's over. And they write a quick conclusion, but it's not quite as good as it could be. So I, you know, this ecosystem of how we handle innovation is really important. So mm -hmm. those are my kind of three fallacies at, at, about the way we handle things sometimes that I wanted to bring up. But I know, and you've got some really interesting, I'd love to hear about your perspective having compared the US to Europe. Like, what are, what are you seeing? What do you see that, that Europe should borrow? And what are you seeing that the US should borrow? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm focusing a little more on what, what uh, Europe should, sure. be, <laughs> should be borrowing, I think. But no, I think, I think the big difference is, I said, I, I think that in Europe we have a culture of regulation, we follow the regulations. I see here that companies are much more willing, some companies are much more willing to go beyond what the regulations require. And I think that is something that we would like to be able to copy in Europe. And certainly we, we are looking for ways to address the marriage between environmental concerns and the economy. I mean, in, in Europe, we're certainly not planning to stop the economy. We're looking for growth. We're looking for new developments. Um, but we also are aware of the fact that, as you say, resources are a limitation at a global scale and in Europe. Um, as as um, Nathan mentioned, uh, um, Wade mentioned at the beginning, Europe is very dependent on imported energy, and not only energy, we import a lot of our resources. So I think that the consciousness about the need to use our resources efficiently comes partly from this dependency that Europe does have on, on imports. And certainly, as we've been through the recent economic crisis, there's been a bit more thinking about how do we want to structure our economy. And the EU policy now, the big overarching policy for the economy is something called the EU 2020. Yeah. And it incorporates explicitly objectives related to resource efficiency. Mm -hmm. But what we're struggling with is we know that's the direction we want to go, um, but you, ca you can't just regulated. You can't put yeah. in a regulation saying industries should be resource efficient and then consider it's done. We see the role of innovation yeah. and I think you're right that it's a culture that needs to, to be developed. It's not something that will happen just by itself. Um, but we are looking at the experience in the U.S., looking at how innovation is promoted and in particular, what I'm interested in now is seeing these companies who've made a decision to go beyond compliance, and sometimes way beyond compliance. Um, Tell me more about that. Why yeah. are they doing that? Yeah, um, there are different reasons. I mean, yeah. some of the perhaps less innovative companies, as soon yeah. as they actually start looking at their production methods, looking at how they produce goods, how they transport goods, they realize if, if they add up the numbers that, well, it, they could do it more efficiently and that yeah. they could use a bit more, a, a, a bit uh, less energy. They could um, perhaps produce a bit less waste and they wouldn't have to pay for all the landfill charges. Uh, perhaps they could use a bit less water. And they find not only do they save money on those processes, but they find that the culture of doing efficiency audits, which I like to call them yeah. rather than just resource efficiency audits, but looking at efficiency in their production processes, saves them money, uses less resources, and sometimes introduces more of a culture of innovation, of thinking, of critical self-analysis that improves the company overall. So I've seen some companies are moving in that way. 
But I think perhaps the most interesting companies are companies who want to look further into the future. Hmm. They're not just looking at today's bottom line. Now you yeah. said you said the problem is where companies are just thinking about their returns today. Some companies do that, but I I get the feeling that there are, are quite a number of companies that do look further ahead. Um, and it seems that the highest performing companies in the US are actually the same ones who are concerned about introducing sustainability into their operations for improving their corporate social responsibility, which is a broader question, that they see it as part of their positioning for the future to open up opportunities for themselves. And those are the real leaders. Yeah. That's interesting. So you would say like, and it is the genesis, you know, the, the firms that are leaders, is the genesis like, where does, where does the initiative to rethink how they're doing things come from? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it from the board of directors? Is it from individuals within the company? What, is it, what does that look like from the things you've seen? Mm -hmm. Well, what I've seen so far, it comes from different sources. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it may actually come even in the U.S. from yeah. something the administration's doing. Yeah. There are a number of grants that have come from the federal government, often via the state or the cities, to go in and do these audits, to mm -hmm. think about the way the company's working. So sometimes it will be an outside influence. Sometimes it comes at the demand of the customers, that mm. the customer base, particularly in some of the more specialty industries like, like outdoor yeah. um, equipment and goods, uh, the customers are expecting a different mm -hmm. kind of behavior. Sometimes it comes from the shareholders, and it's, it's very interesting to see the influence that shareholders have had over changing the performance in some companies. But what, what I have noticed is while all of these things may help drive a company, while, while subsidies will give them an incentive, that it very often seems to come down to champions. Mm -hmm. to individuals who see that it makes sense, and maybe it's because of a personal conviction about sustainability in the world, maybe it comes out of this drive to be a leader company, but it seems that even if all the other conditions are right, you need an individual or a team of individuals who serve as a catalyst to make the change yeah. take place. Is that is that something that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, if I could kind of paint in really broad brush strokes. Um, in 2008, I was kind of trying to compare regions. So I'll just, uh, maybe let me back up and say, so that's, that's really interesting to me. And it's interesting to me because if I make a comparison to the evolution of the solar industry, I think I see a similar pattern. And that is, I did this, com you know, this broad brush stroke comparison of the way that solar photovoltaics developed in China, Europe, and the United States. And if you look at the types of companies that are founded and the way that they're founded, and then we kind of lay on top of that the role of policy and innovation in these different countries, they're very kind of three different approaches. The, the approach in China has been very much to um, provide a lot of capital from government-controlled banks to build very large factories that produce kind of this first generation technology, this silicon based technology, and basically leverage you know, their advantages, cheap capital and cheap labor. Um, and, and if you characterize in terms of innovation, it's not very innovative, but it's very production efficient. By contrast, in the United States, you see almost no you know, silicon, you know, big, silicon, big firms getting into silicon manufacturing. But what the United States did that was unique is they were almost, not exclusively, but the vast majority of entrepreneurs who jumped into second and third generation technologies and said, okay, silicon's great, but we could do 10x or 100x better with this new technology that's further out, came from the United States. And then Europe kind of seemed to be a blend of the two. You know, you get like Q-cells in Germany, which is, you know, an innovative company in terms of producing silicon cells, but you get some other, you know, second and third generation technologies. And, and so I see these kind of different approaches. And, and the problem for me, or at least, you know, maybe this is my bias, but, you know, I love, I love soccer. And, and I feel like these, the stable of U.S. entrepreneurs pursuing these next generation technologies are like this great soccer team. And 
yet there's no st there's no like stadium for them to play in, or there's no coaches to train them. And it's like, you know, if, if we trained them, they could be you know world class. They could be World Cup, but like nobody wants to pay for the coaches. You know, it's kind of how I feel like sometimes. So, um, so I, in my view, I, I see these. You know, I guess if I track that on a policy, I see policy can can really open the the floodgates of uh, you know sowing the seeds of demand. And, and yet you also need these champions, entrepreneurs, individuals, innovators who are going to say, you know, this is where we need to go next and we'll push that. So I think there's, I mean, I think we, you know, part of the reason why we call, call this is I think we really need the cowboys and the politicians. We actually need both. And so what I'm saying is in the U.S. I feel like we've got the cowboys, but maybe not the politicians yet. Um, and in the EU you seem to have the politicians, but Frankly, when I was teaching in France, I, they're trying to be, they're trying to introduce a lot more entrepreneurship in their curriculum and a lot more innovation, but they're learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. So, no, that's def definitely the case. It's something that we need to move ahead on, and um, I think I think we're headed in the right direction. The introduction of resource efficiency into the overall economic policy points the direction to go, and hopefully, will give a, a steer. But we need to really build up. I think it's, it's not a matter of cowboys or politicians. I think we need to build up a partnership, and yeah. that's, that's the way I think we're going to move ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be incredible. And even in terms of just stabilizing the market forces that are kind of shaking, just from the solar perspective, shaking that market around. And I mean, I'm really scared. It's putting a gun to the head of the, 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 the technologies that could really solve this well in the long term. You know, we look at shapes of, of, of you know, innovation, we talk about, you know, usually like an S-curve. So you see technology early on not being very productive, and then as it enters its productive life, you see it become much more productive, you know, rapid rise in efficiency gains. And then at the end of its life, kind of tail off. And that's, I think we're kind of on the tail off end of the silicon solar and the beginning of the thin film and nanostructure materials, but if we don't nurture those, we, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time to get mm -hmm. to that next S-curve. and. And, and resource efficiency, I mean, it's a really interesting topic that uh, I think, you know, in some ways hasn't entered into the conversation enough. Mm -hmm. I'm just beginning to enter the conversation here, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the specific technologies that you mentioned are certainly an important component, but I think we need innovation that goes further than that. I think we need innovative thinking about how to change production processes. We need to have innovative thinking about what a company is really selling yeah. and what is it that the customers want. Do they necessarily want a specific physical product or do they want the service mm -hmm. that comes from the use of that product? So yeah. I, I think we, we need to move to a, an economy that is more agile, that is more perhaps willing to take risks, that's willing to think out of the box. Yeah. Um, and I think both both in the EU and the US, um, it's urgent to move ahead because other parts of the world are doing it. If you look at what both Korea and China are doing, <coughs> and mm -hmm. you mentioned China at the beginning, um, resource efficiency is on their agenda. Moving to mm -hmm. a green economy is on their agenda. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an imperative for them because, as you mentioned, they have all these people that they want to bring into the modern economy, yeah. and they can't do it if they don't find new ways of satisfying yeah. demand. Oh. Well, I think that gives us a, a really good foundation uh, for a conversation. And I think um, what we'd like to do now is invite members of the audience to come and pose some questions. We can uh, go deeper into some of the generalizations that uh, both of the presenters have laid on the table. Uh, we can go in some new directions. There's a, it's a big topic, and there's a lot of places that we can go. Um, so uh, the floor is open and again just please use the microphone. I'm sitting by the microphone so I'm going to use it. <laughs> is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Uh, the question I, I had um, for the both of you um, and um, be because we're kind of hinting at you know that they're you know, part of the, the solution at least when it comes to energy and the environment um, seems like we, there needs to be this investment of, of capital or or at least an environment, um, kind of an economic environment created 
where these kinds of technologies can flourish. And one of the ways to do that um, that's been discussed is through some type of carbon tax or cap and trade or different you know, versions of, of these things. Europe has, has um, experimented uh, a little bit with this. And I wondered, you know, first, if you could hear a little bit about how successful you feel those experiments have been. And, and also, what are some of the things that would get in, in the way, what, which direction is the United States leaning uh, in, in terms of these kinds of questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, as you say, yeah, the EU has moved ahead on this. Um, when you're for the first people to do something, perhaps you don't do it perfectly, but I think we've had a pretty good experience. We have seen it's easier to do the trading, perhaps, than the capping. We, we set an overall cap, but we need to progressively bring it down, and that evidently leads to discussions about how the rights to emit should be reduced. Um, that's something I think we're still working through. But I think for us in the EU, um, it's very clear to us that we need to reduce our carbon emissions. We have a unilateral target that we're certainly going to make for reducing by 20 percent by 2020. Um, there's discussion about even raising that unilaterally, but we know we can't do it alone. You know, there's no such thing as a clean Europe in a dirty world. It won't work. So our great objective, and I, I really have to say frustration at the moment, is the, our inability to bring other countries of the world on board to the same level of commitment. Um, and that's, that's really something that we're very focused on at the moment. Do you see Europe as being committed to cap and trade for the long term? I, I can't answer that. I don't. I don't know. Mm. That's great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, hi. Um, my question is: uh, You mentioned earlier that the U.S. has cowboys, but not the politicians. And I'd, I'd assume, or I'd feel like it's safe to assume that Europe has like the opposite of that. Why do you think that is? And like, what do you think can be done to change that? Can I take a first shot at sure. this? So I, I think there's, it's really helpful to look at the patterns of U.S. policy and economy. Wade mentioned that at one point we were leaders in environmental policy. And um, you mentioned that you're seeing some corporations go above and beyond the call of duty and leading out. And, and I just see two broad trends that I want to highlight. Number one is the role of regulation in the United States. And I think um, if you're interested in this, you know, some kind of popular reading, I'd recommend The Commanding Heights to you. It's a fun book. Um, and basically, you know, if we look at the pattern of regulation in the United States prior to the Great Depression, you have a somewhat re unregulated market. You see a run up in the stock market. You see a crash, a Great Depression, people demanding that we need to do something about this. We have to control. And so you see the pendulum of regulation swing to the end of the spectrum of highly regulated. And then, in, and, and during this period, you know, the U.S. does become a leader in environmental policy. And then with kind of Reagan and Thatcher, you see, you see this period of stagnation, and then Reagan and Thatcher advocating, you know, um, free market economies, you know, uh, you know, with the epitome being the Chicago school, and you know, Milton Friedman, and you see the pendulum slowly swing back all the way over to vast deregulation in the United States. And, and very much, um, and, and I apologize if this word's offensive, but very much a religion of free markets. That free markets are the ultimate solution, they're the only solution, um, especially, in, and pushed that way by some of the opposing political theories, um, and, and that they will solve everything in the long run. And Milton Friedman defining the, the job of the corporation as maximizing profits for shareholders and, and putting you know, profits as the measure and maximization as the goal and uh, that it will all work out in the long run. I think with the recent financial crisis, we start to see the pendulum swinging back the other way a bit where you say, say people saying, wait a minute, I'm not sure that this will really, free markets will really work themselves out in the long run the way I hoped they would. Because I see many individuals walking away with a lot of money and I'm paying for it. Wait a second, that doesn't feel right. And, and so I, my hypothesis is that we'll start to see the pendulum swing back towards regulation. 
and maybe you know policy will play a role. But layered on top of this is the view that managers in business have of who they are. And there's a great book called The Rise and Fall of Management, which postulates that early on, being a manager was more than just maximizing profits, that there was often a sense that you had a duty to your community and to your workers to do good. Now, obviously, not everybody epitomized that. And there, you know, there was a need for labor unions, there was a need for all these things. But one of the things that the Milton Friedman definition of the corporation did was it kind of, it, 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 um, it made the view of what being a manager was uh, separated from that doing good. It was about maximizing profits. And there's a subtle but real movement within management as you know, practiced by managers, as you know, MBAs in their business school programs and professors to say, wait a second, I don't know if we buy that definition. I think being a manager is about more than that, that we also have to do good and we have to be very responsible. So uh, I don't know, I think those, uh, so I, I don't know if we can characterize the U.S. as being one or the other, but being on these pendulum shifts and, and observing the pendulum pattern I think is really important for striking a healthy balance between the two. Because I'll be honest, like when I was an early student in economics, I totally bought free markets are the only way and anything you do to regulate it, you know, you're breaking the system. And now maybe with a little bit more age and experience, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, you know, where, what was the source of that idea and what are the alternatives and, and how do they blend? I mean, I think we're talking a lot about blending. There's, there's a lot more blending there than I had initially in kind of my undergraduate years believe so. If I can just build on that, I think there's an increasing understanding by a lot of managers, a lot of business that uh, maximizing profits only works in the short run if you have a very narrow definition of it, that if you want to have a market to whom to sell in the long run, if you want to have a community that is willing to support having your factories where you want to have them, having your stores where you want to build them, you need to build up some good relations with the community also. Yeah. And I think that's coming back yeah. into the thinking. But, but coming back to the question, I, th I just think the US and the EU do have very different traditions and histories in regard to regulation. And um, that perhaps explains some of the differences in the approach the, in the EU people have a more centralized and interventionist view of, of the role of government. Um, of course, it, it varies from country to country, and the UK is the most like, the US is the most liberal in, in the sense of, of free market tendency. Um, but in general, the EU businesses, the EU citizens, are more open to the intervention of policy actors. Um, but at the same time, there are other factors. The population density is much greater. You say we have this problem with, with the import of resources. So you, you're talking about parts of the world that are different in some fundamental ways that influence how policy is accepted, I think, in the two regions. Mm -hmm. Where do you think multinational corporations fit into the overall panorama? Because they have significant operations here in the U.S. Presumably ought to have a bunch of cowboys in there somewhere. Yeah. And they're also dealing in Europe, so they're used to dealing with policy and regulations mm -hmm. that are different. Are they just too big and too stodgy and too focused on the next quarter bottom line that they just can't put those two pieces together to provide innovation that also can survive in an environment of more regulation. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very interesting question. I, I, I just would say I was very surprised. I went to a meeting in Seattle, or perhaps surprise isn't the right word, but it came to my attention how important the EU regulation in certain areas is even to companies in the US. Um, I was speaking with people from a, 
number of different industries, but all people who were concerned somehow about the chemical content of their products. And they kept talking about REACH. And I said, Simon, you mean the European REACH regulation? They said, yeah, 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 of course. So I, th I think we oversimplify certainly when we're talking about European business and US business, because there are so many companies that straddle the divide. Um, from what I've seen, though, I, I think, yes, perhaps these multinationals are large, and it's sometimes harder to change the direction of big company. But they also have more resources. They have more possibilities. And some of the companies that are moving ahead really are large international companies. And I think some of them see themselves, they want to position themselves as global leaders and they see their role as corporate citizens. And I think some of them are able to use their resources to turn the big machine in another direction. Yeah, I th I'd say it's, it's all along the spectrum because on the one hand, the danger of the multinational is that you can divide up the responsibility and the observation of problems into so many pieces that nothing gets done about it. On the other hand, if you can get responsible actors who are mm -hmm voting for what the corporation does or leading the corporation, they can do a lot of good. And they can set an example. And I mean, I think of, I believe it was Levi's that um, found out that their jeans were being produced by children and, um, you know, the natural inclination is, oh, let's, you know, let's make a policy. You can't hire these children or employ them. But the problem was then they go into child prostitution. And so instead they came up with the solution, well, we'll pay them to go to school. And you know, a large multinational, there, there are a few small companies that could support that kind of expense and have the kind of signal that a big multinational could, could have. And that sends a massive signal to others about what corporate responsibility means. And I mm -hmm. think so, I think it's a, it's, it's a very mixed bag. You know, they can do good and make great good and terrible evil. And, and uh, yeah, it's, tr it's tough, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we have, a, um, as always, um, a lot of issues on the table, and we could probably go on for a long time with discussion, but we also have a reception uh, immediately following Cafe CSE, and so um, I think that will be available in the lobby in just a minute or so. Um, I think this has been a, a terrific primer on some of the issues that are, are confronting us today, uh, two very, very uh, knowledgeable presenters, and I hope that you will uh, join me in thanking them for their contribution to launching the discussion, and I really hope that you'll stick around and enjoy some refreshments afterwards and continue the conversation. Thank you very much.